Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 24 The Winter King. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week we looked at how Scotland was governed in James's absence, and how the English and Scottish churches were brought, unwillingly, closer together. We also saw the early years of England's first Caribbean colony, St Kitts, and the Scots' first attempt at an American colony of their own. We left off with Frederick, husband to Elizabeth Stuart, accepting the crown of Bohemia in opposition to the Austrian Habsburgs. The Bohemians, in offering Frederick the crown, had miscalculated. By making a king out of Frederick a leading member of the Protestant Union, it forced the Austrians to choose between accepting the loss of Bohemia or fighting a war against a vast Protestant alliance. The Bohemians hoped they would choose to accept the situation. The Austrians did not. Bohemia was vital to Habsburg dominance in Central Europe. It was an electorate of the Holy Roman Empire, meaning it had a say in who became emperor, as well as being a prestigious and powerful realm on its own right. They would not give it up without a fight. The vast Protestant alliance also evaporated with the Treaty of Ulm, signed in July 1620, which proclaimed the Protestant Union's neutrality in the conflict between Frederick and Ferdinand. Frederick had now lost the bulk of his hoped-for German allies, but perhaps the situation could be repaired with some fortuitous support from his father-in-law. It was not going to happen. James was furious with his son-in-law. Not only did he see Frederick as the antagonist here, for having joined a rebellion against a lawful sovereign and usurped his crown, but his actions bound the Stuarts to the spreading conflict and threatened James's diplomatic objectives. He wanted peace in Europe, a marriage for his son, and money. Frederick becoming King of Bohemia threatened all of that. For most of James's subjects, war was now inevitable, and many hailed the prospect of defending Protestantism from the forces of the Antichrist, These advocates of war saw Frederick and Elizabeth as champions of Protestantism. One such supporter was the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, who demanded that England answer God's call to defend his true believers. He was only one of many who looked to James for leadership, only to find none on offer. James hated the idea of war in any case, but especially to defend the ill-gotten gains of his daughter and son-in-law. He remained convinced that peace could only be assured through negotiation and diplomacy, and was supremely confident in his own persuasive talents. However, as Professor Croft puts it, the situation had radically changed. Quote, This academic belief in the power of his own reasoning, usually backed up by extremely partial biblical interpretation, did no great harm as long as there were no international emergencies directly affecting his kingdom's interests. As conflagration overtook Central Europe, reason and biblical quotations were not enough, and James stood by helplessly. Further, James was largely unwilling to give the situation the attention it needed. European ambassadors often found the king away on a hunt, such as when news arrived of the invasion of Palatinate territory by Maximilian, the Duke of Bavaria and leader of the Catholic League, in August 1620. He did, however, rage at Gondomar for Spanish involvement in the conflict, after being promised that they would stay out of it. Months prior, Philip II had instructed his ambassador to extend the marriage negotiations as long as possible in order to ensure James's continued neutrality, playing on James's very public desire for peace and a Spanish marriage. In November 1620, Frederick's forces fought the Austrians in the Battle of the White Mountain. It was a crushing defeat for the Protestants, and Frederick was forced to flee Bohemia. He was dismissively called 
the Winter King, for the shortness of his reign. But this was just the first stage of the war. With Frederick on the ropes, Habsburg forces began to encroach further and further into Palatinate territory, and the prospect of its complete annexation was openly being considered, with Duke Maximilian demanding the transfer of Frederick's electorate to himself in return for his services. Why did this change things? Well, in the eyes of James, and many of Frederick's lacklustre allies, the Palatine had, up until this stage, been in the wrong, infringing on the legitimate rights of the emperor by supporting an illegal rebellion. His ejection from Bohemia, and deposition from the throne that was not rightly his, was therefore a valid and justified response. But now, Frederick's ancestral lands were under threat from the Habsburgs, which was itself an infringement of his sovereign rights. Where Catholic sensibilities had been outraged by the actions of the Bohemian Protestants and Frederick's usurpation of the crown, Protestants were now outraged by the invasion of the Palatinate, the threatened oppression of Rhineland Protestants, and the growing war between the Spanish and the Dutch. James was one of those now outraged, or at least publicly so. He made a formal declaration to the Privy Council that he would see Frederick restored to his lands, and ordered a benevolence to be collected to support this endeavour. One might think that with every leading member of the kingdom calling for war, the benevolence would be quite successful, but despite the public acclaim and support for aiding the Palatine, only £30,000 was collected. This was less than half of the 1614 benevolence, and nowhere near the amount that would be needed to outfit a military expedition. So, what was James's financial situation as the reality set in? The royal coffers were, you won't be surprised to hear, in a bit of a state. The lack of success at the 1614 Parliament meant that the king had not received the cash injection that only taxation could provide. Aside from chasing the elusive bounty of a marriage dowry, James funded his government through a variety of different means. We've previously seen how titles were up for grabs for those suitably generous with their purse, as well as the income from duties on trade and the ever-hated impositions. For special occasions, James was more than willing to take out loans. In order to visit Scotland, for example, he requested a loan of £100,000 from the City of London, for one year at 10% interest. After a decade and a half of experience with James, the merchants of the city were less than forthcoming, and only a portion of the £100,000 was collected. They were right to be cautious. James failed to pay the initial sum back within the year time frame, and a year after that, simply stopped paying the interest. Lesson learned, further loans from the city were not forthcoming. After James returned from Scotland, the Crown's debt stood at £726,000, and expenses kept coming. In 1619, parts of the Palace of Whitehall were destroyed in a fire. Inigo Jones was commissioned to design a replacement, which still stands today. There was some good news on the financial side, though. The death of Anne in 1619 was a tragedy. Of course, of course it was a tragedy. But it meant that they didn't have to pay for the household anymore. Her household at Denmark House was then dissolved, which saved quite a bit of money. The other piece of good news for the royal budget was a person, Lionel Cranfield. Cranfield was a merchant, a former client of the Earl of Northampton, who had attached himself to the rising star of Buckingham on the former's death. He had done wonders for Buckingham's own income, and Buckingham proposed him to the king as a miracle solution to his money troubles. Cranfield was efficient. On the orders of the Privy Council, he investigated the costs of the royal household, and in doing so revealed significant corruption. This was, after all, all part and parcel of early modern government, but still it was a notable level, and reducing it led to James's praise. The king appointed him master of the wardrobe, giving him the authority to discover vast abuses. Cranfield and Buckingham were two peas in a pod. Cranfield told his master that, quote, the more desperate the king's estate is presented, the more honour to rectify it, and the more shall your lordship merit of his majesty, end quote. 
So that means Cranfield was more than willing to exaggerate the extent of the problem, so that when he eventually fixed it, the king's gratitude was even greater. There was another motive for this less-than-honest approach to reform. Cranfield and Buckingham both skimmed vast amounts off the top. Again, this was a more or less acceptable aspect of public office, but it will come back to bite both of them in just a few years' time. Cranfield then investigated the Navy, and found that the fleet was in serious disrepair, and the infrastructure to bring them back to a usable condition was so expensive and inefficient that Cranfield complained it would be cheaper to just give them away. The Earl of Nottingham was deprived of the Lord Admiralship, which was, of course, granted to Buckingham, and he began a five-year programme of construction and cost-cutting. The Privy Council, in parallel with the modernisation of the Navy, ordered the counties to upgrade the arsenals of their militias. For all of this activity, Cranfield was rewarded with a promotion, first to the Master of the Court of Wards, and then a position on the Privy Council. There was a significant obstacle to further financial reform, however, the current Lord Treasurer, the Earl of Suffolk. Suffolk was, like Nottingham, a Howard. The Howards had lost much of their influence and position at court during the Overbury scandal, but they were still around, still getting in the way of Buckingham, and siphoning off perfectly good bribes that should have been going to him. The feeling was certainly mutual. Early in 1618, Suffolk had attempted to perform the same trick that had given Buckingham so much power. He began grooming a young man to catch the eye of the king, treating his skin with posset curd to try and improve it, and putting him in the vicinity of James. Buckingham was many things, but he wasn't dense. He knew what the Howards were trying to do. He had been that young man just a few years before, and so Buckingham went on the offensive. He told James about the rumours surrounding Suffolk's wife, that the treasury would only pay their creditors if she received a bribe. James had Lady Suffolk exiled from London, and when she returned, the king suspended Suffolk from the treasury. In October 1619, the Suffolks were found guilty of corruption by the court of Star Chamber. They, and almost all of the Howard clan, were stripped of their great officers, and this was a significant turning point in the administration of James's reign. Not that Suffolk had been innocent of the charges, far from it. He was a government minister, of course he took bribes, but he had gone far beyond the era's incredibly high tolerance. He had also allowed his family to benefit from his position, and it had caught up with him. Buckingham, with the Howards now removed, was largely secure, especially with his growing friendship with the young Prince of Wales. The fall of the Howards left openings, which Cranfield was able to exploit. He joined the newly formed Treasury Commission, which had been created after Suffolk's ejection from the Lord Treasury ship, and Cranfield would soon hold that position himself. Not everything was going Cranfield's way, however. Against his advice, James enforced new impositions on coal, cloth and tobacco. As a merchant by trade, Cranfield was well aware that trade had begun to slow as the conflict on the continent increased, both in terms of goods being exchanged, but also changes in the exchange rate between English coinage and European markets. This did bring in more money to royal coffers, however, and Cranfield managed to make a further saving of £85,000 a year but the king refused to slow down his spending. The royal debt had sat at just over £700,000 in 1617. Despite three years of Cranfield's reforms, this had risen to over £900,000. For every new revenue stream Cranfield created for the king, James gave away a third of it. Court pensions alone accounted for a sixth of the crown's annual income, Various notables, and even some non-notables, benefited greatly from James's generosity. The Marquis of Hamilton received £13,000 over four years, the Earl of Holderness was granted £500 a year in land, while a mere page was given £300 a year, more than most gentlemen. Buckingham, of course, was the chief beneficiary of this largesse. The coal impositions brought in £16,000. He received half, 
When his wife gave birth to his first child, James gave him £20,000 just to renovate his mansion, with an extra £10,000 for a child bed and £3,000 to renovate his London home. I can only imagine Cranfield's frustration at trying to rein in his king. As trade collapses, taxes haven't been granted for over half a decade and the crown's debt skyrockets, James was giving away everything he achieved. But now, with war on the horizon, and the hoped-for marriage dowry still non-existent, James finally accepted reality. In November 1620, the call went out. Over half a decade since the last collapsed in a blaze of royal fury, a parliament was to be held. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and it's bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RecordedHistory. That's B A. B-B-E-L dot com, code recorded history, Babel language for life. Parliament opened in January 1621. The first sight the MPs and lords saw was their king being carried into the hall. Now in his fifties, after a life of drinking and hunting and eating, he was too physically weak to make the journey on his own. But he was far from being written off. While he did often have to delegate, mostly to Buckingham and increasingly Charles, he still had great moments of kingship. His opening speech was one of those. He declared that, while he preferred peace, he would go to war if there was no other way to restore the Palatinate to Frederick. My crown, my blood, and the blood of my son here shall not be spared for it, he promised. His efforts were rewarded very quickly with the Commons voting two subsidies, worth around £160,000. James thanked them, and in doing so reminded everyone of previous parliaments by praising them for their no-merchant-like dealing. By which he meant they'd done what he'd asked. However, from here the relationship began to decline. There were many in the kingdom who feared that Parliament, as an institution, was losing many of the privileges it had earned over the previous centuries. The seven-year gap had been longer than any other since 1515, and the monarch had used a range of highly unpopular policies just to try and avoid calling his subjects to a parliament. This feeling was common even within the government itself. Sir Thomas Edmonds, a privy councillor no less, wrote privately that the kingdom had been undone if we had been much longer without a parliament. It's important to consider the context before writing off these concerns. Obviously, we know in hindsight that parliament would eventually take over government from monarchs, but at the time, English parliamentarians had to only look across the channel to see apparently similar cases of absolutist tendencies crippling parliaments. In France, the Estates General had had its power and influence reduced by successive royal governments, while in Spain, the Cortes of Aragon had been completely neutered after 1592. So, after their initial burst of approval for the King's agenda, the Commons got down to the business of doing what they believed they had been elected to do. 
They had provided the king with the first round of subsidies, but in order for him to receive more, he would have to listen to their complaints. And they had plenty. The impositions, of course, returned to the agenda as hated restrictions on trade and a violation of Parliament's rights. The court controversies since the last Parliament, such as the murder of Overbury, the charges of corruption against the Howards, and even accusations of incest brought in Star Chamber, had all been noted by the Kingdom. Any residual respect for high office, which might have acted as a shield against further complaints, was gone. And while the impositions were still a highly unpopular policy, it was the practice of monopoly patents that most irked the Commons in 1621. This was very bad news for Buckingham, as many of these had been granted to him or to members of his family. This would set the tone for the relationship between Buckingham and Parliament for the rest of his life, as criticism after criticism was thrown at the extended Villiers clan. The dispute also saw the revival of parliamentary impeachment, last used on a royal minister in the 1450s, and which would see plenty of use over the coming decades. Buckingham had powerful enemies in both Houses of Parliament, and for multiple reasons. In the Lords, he was particularly despised by the Earls of Southampton and Oxford, but broadly disliked due to the massive expansion of the peerage, as the Villiers clan exploited their control over patronage to elevate those willing to pay into the aristocracy. In the Commons, the monopolies and impositions were hated, and that hatred was easily placed onto the shoulders of Buckingham as a prime beneficiary of them. His enemies in the Lords collaborated with those in the Commons. Southampton encouraged a group of MPs, most notably Sir Edwin Sandys, who we last saw arranging the plantation of Plymouth Colony, to use the investigations into the monopolies as a way to strike at Buckingham. James was not best pleased by this attack on his favourite, and at one point had Southampton, Oxford and Sandys arrested, although they were promptly released. Whatever happened, James was not about to let Buckingham be sacrificed in order to sate Parliament. Less so his Lord Chancellor. Sir Francis Bacon was in a tough spot during the first session of Parliament. He was just as tarnished by the monopoly patents as Buckingham, but marshalled far less support from the King. He also faced a combined assault from enemies on the Privy Council, particularly Lionel Cranfield, as well as the Commons, notably Sir Edward Coke, the former Chief Justice of the King's Bench. Coke had fallen out of favour after repeated disagreements with James over the law, as well as from the machinations of Bacon. Now it was time to return the favour. Over twenty charges of corruption were laid at his feet, and they were almost certainly true. He was a government minister, of course he took bribes. But he could have survived this had the king backed him. But James did not. In a choice between Bacon or Buckingham, he would always choose Buckingham. Well aware that without the King's protection, Parliament would find him guilty, Bacon wrote a confession and begged their mercy. He was impeached by Parliament, forbidden to hold future office or sit in Parliament, fined £40,000, and remanded in the Tower of London. James was able to aid his former Chancellor after the fact, though, by cancelling the fine and releasing Bacon after just a few days, Cranfield was soon awarded the position of Lord Treasurer, and made a baron, but by having Parliament do his dirty work, he had set the stage for his own demise. Once a goat had been suitably scaped, James made a show of listening to Parliament's concerns. As the session closed for Easter, during the King's speech, he drew the sword of a nearby courtier, and joked that he would kill the Speaker. Considering how he had furiously dissolved previous parliaments, this might not have been too outlandish, but instead he knighted the man in full view of both houses. This was a masterful act of theatre, which made it clear that James respected parliament as an institution. That it was just that, theatre, did not become immediately apparent when the houses reassembled after the break. James pledged that had he known about the most abusive monopolies, he would never have allowed them. (laughs) 
and swore that he would protect his subjects from them in the future. After that session ended in July, he made good on his word, revoking 20 monopoly patents outright and disowning 17 more. This allowed them to be disputed by Parliament, which promptly did so. But the Parliament had been called to discuss war, and discuss it they did. The Council of War had estimated the cost of an expeditionary force to relieve the Palatinate to cost £200,000 to raise, and £190,000 a year to supply. This was far beyond what had been voted so far, and if more was to be granted, then Parliament had to be convinced that it was needed. James and his Privy Council had to conduct a balancing act. Embracing anti-Catholic belligerents would surely lead to a Parliament willing to pay for the war, but this sentiment was almost always entangled with anti-Spanish feeling, and James still wanted his Spanish Catholic daughter-in-law. He didn't want war with Spain. He didn't really want war at all, and was hoping that the act of funding and raising a force to intervene on the continent would bring everyone back to the negotiating table. Parliament did not agree, and received highly mixed signals from the government. One MP, Sir Edward Giles, complained that we must fight with the Spaniards in the Palatinate and be friends with them everywhere else, and that perfectly sums up their confusion. This confusion wasn't aided by the lacklustre guidance from on high. In November 1621, when Maximilian was on the brink of capturing Palatinate lands, James recalled Parliament, only to stay in Newmarket with Buckingham. Instead of opening the session himself and telling Parliament what he needed, he sent Charles. Now, you could argue that this was sensible parenting, useful experience for his future role as king. Maybe it was. But Charles had never addressed Parliament, and the Privy Councillors had little guidance to give him. They hadn't been given any themselves. Neither the Prince nor the Privy Council could manage Parliament effectively, because they didn't really know what royal policy was meant to be. Nevertheless, the Commons voted another subsidy. But matters came to a head when Sir George Goring, a known client of Buckingham, declared that the Commons should petition the King to declare war. Because of Goring's known connection to Buckingham, they assumed that Goring spoke for the favourite, and everyone knew that the favourite spoke for the King. Now, whether or not Goring was acting on orders from on high is debatable. If his words were the King's, then it was likely to just be an attempt to apply pressure on the Habsburgs. Look, my Parliament wants to go to war. You need to back off the Palatinate, or else. If they were from Buckingham alone, then it's likely he wanted to divert attention from himself as well as gain some allies in the Commons. Gondomar would write that Goring was acting on the King's orders, not to apply pressure to Spain, mind you, but to sabotage the Parliament. Why would he want to do this, when the Commons seemed to be granting him taxation? Well, the Commons had been debating the Spanish match. This was far outside of their remit, as far as both James and Charles were concerned. Parliament believed that Charles should have a Protestant wife, and disliked closer links with Spain. As we've already discussed, James saw the marriage negotiations as a way to bring about peace on the continent, and if successful, a huge marriage dowry. It was foreign policy and private family business, and neither were the business of Parliament's. The Commons responded by sending a protestation to the King, defending their right to free speech. James responded to their response by angrily ripping the petition out of the official record, ordering the arrest of Coke for having authored it, and dissolving Parliament. In doing so, James lost out on that third subsidy, which had been voted on, but had not yet been confirmed. The mismanagement and failure of the 1621 Parliament meant that James would have to return to the Spanish marriage as a means of securing peace, as well as supporting his bank balance. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Pax Britannica is nearing 100,000 downloads, and it should reach it by the six-month anniversary of the launch. However, the week before that is my birthday, 
and I'd love it if I could reach that milestone before then. So, if you haven't already, please send a link to Pax Britannica to a friend that might enjoy it, or recommend it online. Word of mouth is still the best way of growing an audience, and every little helps. Thank you to the Peers of the Realm, the Royal Headsman, executed today, Her Grace the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Most Honourable, the Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Right Honourable Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens, the Honourable Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley, the Right Honourable Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan, the Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner, the Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence, the Right Honourable Earl of Hereford, Christopher Remo, the Earl of Dunbar, Angus Wilson, the Right Honourable Earl of Southampton, Alan Goldstein, and the Right Honourable Earl of Northampton, Justin Drowns. If you want to join their ranks, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Every pledge tier comes with a personalised ad-free RSS feed, and the higher ranks come with more perks. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music in today's episode, my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>